Hi everyone, Kate back for a couple reviews for some more of my Reading Through the Ages books. And these are from the America's Early Settlement Challenge that was uh, included. And this is a setting that I found, uh, discovered through reading these books, I really enjoy for historical fiction. So I know when I am, you know, next searching uh, for just some that I can pick up on my own, you know, not trying to complete challenges, I will be looking for some uh, early settlement America uh, ones. So um, I read both by the same author, Elizabeth George Spear, and my dad had really recommended her and just said she was a wonderful storyteller. And so she writes middle grade historical fiction. And the first that I read by her was The Witch of Blackbird Pond, I don't know why I have just I had never been that interested in this. It won a Newbery and I do now this is like kicked off a Newbery project where I just found I, I'm basically checking out um, all of the Newbery winner audiobooks on Overdrive that I can because a lot of them my four year old will listen to them. Like if I have it on and I'm cooking, he will not be as talkative and um and he'll and he'll listen more, which makes it really nice for me that I can, you know, just get I feel like I'm getting an extra reading if he's up and about and still, you know, letting me read and uh just being nice and quiet. Uh so yes, anyhow, The Witch of Blackbird Pond, I wasn't that compelled because it's set um during uh, Puritan times. And I think that the whole Salem witch trials thing is, I think it's a little tired and I, I don't like the angle that's, that's put on it very often. And it's just uh, like, just the way it looks at Puritans as kind of one dimensional. Um, and a lot of it is true, you know, granted what they say about Puritans, but I don't know. I just felt like it was kind of it's kind of a tired topic sometimes, but I ended up enjoying this book so much. So uh, our protagonist is Kit, and Kit has lived in Barbados her whole life. She knows that her aunt, when she was a little girl, uh, moved to Connecticut. She married a Puritan, and she moved to Connecticut, but she's never been there herself. But then um, she and she's always lived with her grandfather on his plantation. But then her grandfather dies and um, ended up leaving a lot of debt. So she doesn't have, you know, this big inheritance to live off of. And the only family she knows is this the Puritan aunt and uncle and now some cousins uh, who are around her age who live in um, Connecticut. And so she decides to, um, she writes to them, you know, wondering if she can come, but obviously ships only come so often. So she decides she's just going to assume they would have said yes. And she gets on the boat and she goes, um, and already while she is on the boat and different things happen, like a, somebody drops something off the boat, a little kid, and they're really upset about it. And she's, dives in and goes for it. Um, and they assume because she can swim that she's a witch like that, you know that things are going to be different. Kit comes to the village and, um, and meets the family. Her aunt is very warm and welcoming. And one of the cousins is very warm and welcoming. The other is a little bit more aloof, but the uncle is who she's really scared of. Just like no smile, no show of emotion. Um, he agrees to let her stay, but he's very stern. And I think she can kind of tell they're going to have, have a, a difficult relationship. Um, so transitioning into life in Connecticut is very hard for Kit. Um, one, because it's a, so much colder than Barbados, um, just unbelievably colder. Also, uh, this is not, this is a very new community. They don't have tons of resources. And, um, so, you know, things are scarce, things are tight. In addition to that, it is a Puritan community. So things are just a lot more serious and sober uh than that her home life was even just down to what you what you dress in you know you can't have too many ruffles that's worldly on a dress you can't um you know reading novels is a no-no singing anything that isn't <clears throat> a hymn is a no-no so it's just a very different pace of life and style of life than she has been accustomed to um, and she's very homesick while she's there. 
Um, also, while she's there, she learns about a woman who people have called the Witch of Blackbird Pond. Um, her name is Hannah, and she is an old widow. And then eventually, um, a pretty shortly into the book, Kit ends up meeting Hannah. And uh, they call Hannah a witch because she is a Quaker. I love that detail that, like, it's so scandalous that she's a Quaker. Um, that was another thing that was interesting about this book was to learn about kind of the uh, religious persecution that Quakers felt in the New World. It's just so ironic. You know, the pilgrims sailed to the New World for religious freedom and then just a little while into that, the Quakers are being persecuted. And apparently in Massachusetts, some of them were branded so you could know, you know, who was a Quaker. So Hannah and her husband experienced persecution in Massachusetts. And so they moved to Connecticut. Her husband has passed away and she just tries to keep quiet and not really make any stirring. She just wants to have a nice, quiet life in her you know, nice little cottage at the edge of the village, but she's very, very lonely. So Kit quickly becomes a friend to her, even though um, she knows that it won't make her aunt and uncle and cousins happy, but she just kind of visits there secretly anyway. Um, but you do get to know her cousins better and you, she does grow fond of them. And there are, um, I really liked just hearing about daily life in this, the different chores that they do, uh, the different um, ways that they pass the time through knitting or sewing. Um, and uh, also Kit is just a really winsome protagonist. I found I was just really compelled by her and I, I just adored her by the end. And uh, I also enjoyed, you get to hear about, she helps uh, one of the cousins out at a school and helps teach the younger ones and figure out creative ways to teach them. Uh, and along with all of that happening, there are two young men who are visiting the house regularly um and the girls are trying to figure out is it for kit is it for one of the cousins and do they have the cousins names here this is so annoying i they just left me you know as soon as i as soon as i tried uh well anyhow so there's lots of you know inner dialogue kit wondering about that because it seems like one of them is <coughs> is interested in kit and she isn't actually interested in him in him uh, so yeah, you're just getting to follow them over the course of the year. And that is a neat thing also to see Kit experience seasons for the first time. And as much as she really doesn't like the desolation and the cold of winter, um, she really appreciates spring when it comes then. Uh, so she gets to experience all those seasons, but eventually it does come out that she is friends with Hannah, um, who everyone is called the witch. And so then she has to go on trial. Uh, so yeah, I really liked the pacing of this. I enjoyed the characters. Uh, the writing style is rather simple, but it's incredibly compelling. It's just, she knows how to tell a story and how to, uh, lead it along. So all in all, I really recommend The Witch of Blackbird Pond. Like I said, it's a Newbery winner. It has spurred me on uh, to read more Newberries, and I'm really looking forward to reading more of those. The next one that I read was also by Elizabeth George Spear, and that was The Sign of the Beaver. This is set in Maine, uh, where our main character of Matt, his father had bought the land that they were going to live on and they have a cabin there, but then he has to go back for the, for Matt's mother and sisters, um, or mother and sister. And, uh, so Matt is there on his own to take care of this cabin. He's about, I think it's 14. I have to look this up, of course, because it's really going to bother me. Um, 12. So he's only 12 years old. Can you imagine a 12 year old today doing this? People were just so tough. So he leaves Matt. Matt's in charge. And while he's there, Matt meets uh, a Native American boy named Etienne. And at first, their friendship is very tumultuous. And um, they don't really understand one another. Uh, but then they really, it's neat. They really start to gain uh, true respect for one another. So um, Matt shows him different books and teaches Atian to read in English. And Atian uh, shows Matt how he knows the forest like the back of his hand and how to be so resourceful um, and just use things that are already there and not 
have extra tools for everything, um, to go, to go fishing, to use like reeds and all sorts of interesting things. So it was really neat to hear about the natural resources that were there and the ways that Atian kind of figured out how to use it. And I, this is so annoying. I'm trying to, oh, the beaver tribe. That's what he is. He's from the beaver tribe. I was trying to remember what tribe he was from. Um, and so they just spend uh, an, an incredible amount of time together, uh, just learning, learning the land. And at one point, uh, he gets to go, Matt gets to go and, uh, to a, a bear roast with Atian's family. He is invited and that's really neat to see. So yeah, it's really neat to see their friendship, but there is this undertone of sadness, um, which of course is going to happen with any book involving Native Americans, uh, of just uh, having everything, absolutely everything just taken from them. And then kind of, what are they supposed to do? What are they expected to do? Um, so that was one thing that was really sad listening to this, um, just knowing such a unique and special way of life was going. Um, and so at the end of the book, um, they realize that more and more settlers are coming. And ironically, Matt, the cabin that he lives in is on land that Atian, like they was considered Atian's families. Um, and so, uh, but he's still, he's still friends with him and, but Atian's family has to leave to kind of find a less, less populated place. Uh, so yeah, I did want to read something like from the Native American experience. I tried the Birch Bark House by Louise Erdrich, but it was, it was boring. I, uh, sorry, it was boring. I didn't like it. So if you know of like a middle grade book from the Native American with like an own voices Native American book, I would be really curious. Um, because that, that is, you know, a, a picture that I got a little bit with the sign of the beaver, but it was much more of, it, it was much more, uh, like this is, this is the, this is Matt's perspective on Atian as opposed to vice versa. So yeah, I enjoyed those two books. I'm really enjoying this challenge and I will let you, um, I'll let you know what I am reading for it next. Bye.